Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Ulrich, for uh, that brief introduction. Um, I believe my task this evening is very easy um, in the sense that I do not have the privilege uh, to pontificate. Uh, I do not have the privilege to um, stir the pot. But um, my task, nevertheless, is to you know, help uh, steer a conversation um, that I hope uh, for all of us is informative, rich, um, but also, more importantly, compelling. And the topic that we have this evening is a most compelling topic. I think uh, a subject that we've all been preoccupied with over the last few months. And it's a topic of controversy, but it's also a topic of the relationship between art, um, questions of dissidency, and resistance. But also, it concerns the place of art and the place of, say, the public intellectual within the context of what I call societies in transition and how those societies negotiate and manage the difficult work of transition. And in the particular case of China, it is a most historical transition that China is engaged with over many years now. And to that extent then, I think the question we have to ask ourselves is this. How do we, in the larger global arena, given China's um, emerging position, take part in debates that extends beyond the borders of China? On the one hand, I think it would be very easy to engage China in a rhetoric and of values, Chinese values, which can be condensed in a sort of ironic sense um, with a statement, and I think it's not a proper uh, quote, but nevertheless by Deng Xiaoping, of China's transition being capitalism with socialist characteristics. And how do we take up that conundrum, that paradox of capitalism and what one will call the, I, I don't want to sort of qualify what it is, the overwhelming apparatus of the state and the role of the state in legislating what is proper. So part of our discussion this evening is about the question of what is proper proper in terms of the social sphere, proper in terms of the individual subjectivity of the artist, but also in terms of the responsibilities of artists as citizens to speak freely, to make the space of art an emancipatory space that is capable of absorbing that great power that the state puts forward as its exclusive property, which is to silence on the one hand and to give authorization on when to speak. And so the state as both patron and also as the very brutal sword of justice. So this is an important question, but I do not want to say that what is currently going on in China is any different from the messy, unruly, complex transitions that have been part of the emergence of modernity. And in this sense, we need to think of China and the relationship of what we are going to talk about today to the very context from which it emerges, which is the Chinese contemporary art sphere on the one hand, and on the other, the context of the global art sphere that challenges 
the boundaries that states might put forward as a way to sort of either restrict or to protect certain entrenched interests. So Ai Weiwei as a figure is not unfamiliar to most of you here. And I think it's safe to say that there is a dimension of over-familiarity, but over-familiarity with Ai Weiwei, the figure uh, that might not be properly supported by an awareness of the deeper complexity of his entanglement with his society. That's one. Two, is the question of has the Kun's relationship to this extraordinary figure and artist, this individual um, whose position in the world has excited us but has also, uh, in other ways, placed many demands to really ask questions of the boundaries uh, between citizenship and activism, between dissidency and the commoditization of, of that. On another level, what we need to also maybe enable ourselves to explore, based on this question of over-familiarity, is when did Ai Weiwei, the figure, first capture our imagination? And I will hazard this position that most people here may have never been in contact or heard of Ai Weiwei 12 years ago or 10 years ago. So this relatively new phenomenon can be connected to the emergence not only of Ai Weiwei himself, but the emergence of the contemporary Chinese art sphere in the global arena and the occasion of its movement in you know, powerful way into the global art scene. So that in itself really also demands some reflection on our part. And so to help us think about many of the vexing questions that the situation or the predicament of Ai Weiwei has thrown up, uh, very um, knowledgeable experts uh, in different fields that can really help us sort of open up a dimension of discussion that will you know, um, lead, hopefully, to a compelling debate. And I will begin from my left um, to introduce, and my introduction uh, will be very brief. And um, Hu Han Ru, um, who, uh, as many of you know, um, has played an extraordinary role in the debates and the questions concerning um, contemporary Chinese art, but not, that's not the only thing he does. Han Ru is currently the director of exhibitions and, uh, and public programs and chair of the exhibitions and museum studies program at San Francisco Art Institute and has curated many exhibitions. He's a prolific writer. But I just want to underscore one important part of Han Ru's biography, which was that Han Ru left China in 1990 and moved to Paris in the immediate aftermath of the Tiananmen um, event. And like most of his contemporaries, we can say that Tiananmen was uh, really um, life-changing and mobilized different ways of thinking about the role of art in society. He was also involved, and I suppose I believe it, as an uh, assistant or connected with um, the next you know, speaker, Gao Ming Lu, um, in the China avant-garde exhibition that um, Ming Lu and others organized in Beijing in 1989, the seminal exhibition that nobody saw because it lasted for exactly three days, or how, how long? Uh, well, about uh, 
More than a week. More than a week yeah. before it was, it was shut, shut down. down twice. Before it was shut down. So in any case, that's. Um, it was shut down, reopened. Yeah. Okay. Ming Lu um, is a professor of art history at the uh, University of Pittsburgh, and um, got his PhD from Harvard University in um, in the United States, and again has written extensively. Um, on you know uh, Chinese uh, modern and contemporary art, the so-called you know ch uh, uh, Chinese avant-garde, and continues to play a very critical role as an academic in China today. And um, next to Ming, Ming Lu is Flora Sapio, who comes from slightly different point of view. Um, she uh, is a, um, an expert in, 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 in China. She received a PhD in China, China, uh, China studies and um, has been a postdoctoral research, researcher at the Center for East and South Asian Studies at Lund University in Sweden and currently a research fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in Maximilians University at Würzburg in, here in Germany. Her main research interests are criminal justice, administrative detention, extra legal violence, and, and coercion, so-called what we will call uh, the dimension of transitional justice uh, that is currently emerging. And to my right um, is, um, wait, let me find it. <laughs> I skipped it, sorry. Um, To my right um, is uh, Xin Ming, who is a journalist at, based in Cologne, uh, originally from China, and has been living in Cologne for the past um, 22 years, and has done work, uh, freelance work for uh, Deutschland Funk, you know, Süddeutsche Rundfunk, Hessische Rundfunk, and many other Rundfunks in Germany. And <laughs> Um, obviously, I need not introduce my colleague, um, Ulrich um, you know, Vilmes, who uh, is a fixture in the landscape of Munich uh, as an art historian, as a curator, and a highly esteemed colleague, but most importantly, the chief curator of House of Kunst, uh, with whom um, I'm now embarking on uh, a most uh, interesting and exciting um, you know, journey. But let me just simply, uh, because this is about this panel, uh, I just want to say very quickly uh, how immensely delighted I am to be here this evening and to see this sea of faces, uh, that if this is the normality in um, Munich, uh, then um, I very much look forward to um, having a lot of fun, um, and, and um, so thank you so much for coming. So uh, shall we begin um, the first presentation with Ulrich? Thanks, Okui, for the kind introduction, and I, I can only reply that I'm also, of course, look very much forward to accompanying you on that journey which will be adventurous for any one of us. And I would like to just give a brief uh, introduction or better to say a recall of the exhibition that took place in Haus der Kunst uh, two years ago from October 2009 to January 2010. Ai Weiwei's exhibition was accompanied by a number of very, very specific circumstances, not to say overshadowed, uh, which had to do with this work, remembering, that you see here, and of course with the following events up to this year. Of course, remembering is the work that Ai Weiwei did for the facade for the Haus der Kunst being put together from uh, 
9,000 backpacks that are similar to those that the Chinese children have won during when the earthquake in Sichuan uh, was earlier in 2009 and killed about more than 6,000 children. And uh, in the foyer we had this photograph which became world famous. It's showing Ai Weiwei in the elevator of the hotel where he was arrested during the trial against his colleague who was, so to say, doing the research on the names of the lost children. Here we see then the result of this arrest. Ai Weiwei, when he came to Munich mid-September in 2009, uh, we had to take him almost immediately to hospital because he had a hematome uh, in his head and so he was there for almost a week and which didn't keep him, as you see here, to communicate what was going on with him all over the world even before we were ready to go to the press and uh, inform them about his fate. The exhibition was, was opened by uh, his yeah, very famous work template that he did for the Documenta 2007. And we all remember that this construction out of antique doors was destroyed during a thunderstorm. And Ai Weiwei, of course, uh, took that as a kind of lucky event and uh, adapted this, so to say, destroyed sculpture into a new form. In the center of the exhibition was, of course, the main hall uh, with an installation of actually three works, the first of which you see here, this huge uh, carpet that was specially made for this space, 360 square meters, uh, the soft ground which followed exactly the, uh, the images that the tiles of the floor gave him as a sample and uh, made this carpet of. On the floor were the uh, 100 trunks and roots from very old trees that he collected in the deserts of China. Um, and around it was a remembrance of his work for the documenta uh, that, that invited 1,001 Chinese fellow citizens to join him for the documenta. And you see here uh, uh, an event that we once did in a, when some invited people had the chance to really walk into it, which couldn't be allowed for the general public because of security reasons. But there were some events where we could do that. And here are the beds and the uh, the suitcases of this as a part of this installation fairy tale that brought the Chinese people to Kassel. Then, of course, we had sculptural works, two examples you see here, grapes. Then we had the installation through and uh, finally coming back already to the other side and to the end, Huji, Ball of Pearls and Dust to Dust, of course, Bougie reminds us it was, so to say, the base for the huge installation that IWA did for the Turbine Hall in London <clears throat> in the Tate Gallery last years. And then in the end, one very, very well known and uh, something like a trademark for his work, the antique vases. These are the colored ones, not the destroyed ones. And uh, so we had at that time an overview over Ai Weiwei's work, and uh, yeah, that was the statement. And uh, I think 
the whole exhibition turned out to be to be really very very influential and gave us some responsibility to participate in the discussion of the things to follow after our exhibition. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Ulrich. Um, I, I thought that it's um, um, important for us to set a context uh, for Iowa's relationship to Hasekunz. And now, um, you know, um, we we'll, I will turn the mic over to uh, Gaming Lu, uh, who will get a, give a short statement, and then. Um. <clears throat> okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, I just today uh, came from Beijing. Uh, I just today I just want to tell you what I have seen actually recently uh, uh, around Aweiwei's case. Uh, when Aweiwei uh, arrest, I was in the state. Uh, and immediately, uh, museum and the newspaper and the media, you know, respond very uh, intensively. And New York Times uh, find me to ask me to write something, and those are the petition uh, we sign uh, for uh, IV's rest. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so later, I went back to China. When I got in China, I feel there's a big contrast. The contrast is that uh, it didn't, I didn't expect that uh, Actually, in China, when I ask artists or a critic or a people in the art world, um, people didn't pay that much attention and very much sympathy on uh, every case, uh, even though everybody knows this, you know, what happened. Uh, and also people talking about how government uh, controlled the website and their, you know, uh, if Iwei's name appeared, uh, the message would be immediately uh, just eliminated. So these political people, those political uh, situation people also know uh, what reason the government declare, for example, like a tax. Um, but actually in China, um, almost all the artists has similar kind of problem in this tax uh, the problem. And I think the reason why, um, and also I think a lot of people in China, in China now, they didn't know, they don't know uh, what happened when I was arrest immediately, uh, they respond from uh, New York uh, and Europe. And um, so people seem to keep silent. The silence on the one hand is controlled by the government. On the other hand, I think there perhaps something that is more uh, complicated. Uh, first of all, for example, um, in our world, right now people talking about most hot news is, for example, like uh, in a uh, city like Chengdu, uh, they have a kind of uh, uh, bad new exhibition. The city government put 400 million Chinese dollars, particularly just on these uh, events uh, this year. Uh, Banu exhibition and the people talking about auction, talk, talking about the market, talking about this uh, price, and even uh, some even famous artists whose price is very high uh, on the top uh, recently also worry about uh, their future. So you think the artist right now in artist's mind thinking about the different way. Um, and also garment uh, Controlled politically, controls media. On the other hand, uh, in art world, they also open certain kind of space. They want to build uh, uh, perhaps uh, the biggest contemporary art museum uh, in the world. And also, they <coughs> invite uh, just last year, uh, there's a controversy about these events. A uh, lot of the most famous artists. Uh, or famous in market, or famous in uh, contemporary art history uh, from outside China and inside China has been invited by the government as a member of the high rank uh, academy uh, in the uh, garment, uh, uh, garment uh, 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 
uh, controlled uh, academy in Beijing. So it's the uh, political policy. Uh, the government not only controls political media, but also opens certain kind of a policy to the art world. So it seems to me uh, the artists right now, this moment, not this modern moment, actually many years, at least 10 years, uh, enjoy certain kind of things in uh, our world, uh, including uh, in particular market, uh, this. When I will be actually, um, he belongs to star generation. Star generation is just after the Cultural Revolution in 1976. In 1979, this group of artists took demonstration on the street in Beijing. Uh, because the police uh, shut down their exhibition. And Ivy actually among the young, is youngest artist uh, among this group. And in 1980, uh, almost all the artists from this group uh, went abroad, including Ivy, who took about more than 10 years, 13 years in New York. And what he studied, actually studied conceptual art, postmodernism, data, this kind of concept. And 1993, he, he brought this kind of, uh, he thought, his new idea uh, back to China. But unfortunately, actually, in 1980s, there already uh, got, uh, got avant-garde movement. Uh, my, myself, personally, uh, involved in this, uh, I call 85 movement. Uh, it's about 100 avant-garde groups. Uh, took place uh, nationwide in different cities. So I will actually, uh, when he got back to China, he uh, worked with some artists and critics. He produced three uh, kind of archive, uh, this kind of book, a black book, white book, and a green book, uh, to uh, collect some, uh, some avant-garde uh, performance <coughs> and some conceptual. But uh, until actually last term, um, until perhaps around uh, last uh, few years, uh, uh, 2004, 2005, actually he didn't get uh, very, very much, uh, very much attention until he participated in uh, international exhibition. Actually, in certain signs, it is international art world that make IVV uh, more uh, and more uh, famous than within China, because Ai Wei is a very controversy uh, kind of person, uh, artist in China, in, uh, in art world. And uh, I have to make it very short. It just gave conclusion, then we can you know, yeah. give up the discussion. Well, just wrap up your thoughts, and of course, we have more <laughs> yeah. opportunities so, to. Yeah. My view is I respect Ai Wei's. Um, they criticize uh, and uh, the fight with government in the last few years in uh, protecting uh, commoners' people's rights in China. But that is, and also he try also put his this kind of political view uh, into uh, the art, uh, his artwork. And uh, but uh, look at you know the Chinese most Chinese artists right now in in. in in, in, especially in avant-garde, uh, we can find that not a lot of artists are interested in how to uh, push this society and how uh, directly to be involved in uh, this social reform and to criticize uh, the government corruption and whatever this kind of political problem in China right now, from the government down to the commoner people, <coughs> corruption everywhere, every corner. And so um, I think it's very, very significant. Uh, but how to link this uh, political activity to everybody's art uh, creation of artwork that is still uh, waiting for uh, our uh, research and discussion. For example, when we look at uh, uh, Ivy's work, uh, immediately perhaps we can find that the space, what Ivy made in museum space, actually is to me like a communist space, which is very big, which involves a lot of labors, and the labor he uh, 
He paid money to the laborers. He hired a lot of people to make this kind of uh, artwork. And the material he collect from also the laborers help him to, uh, to, uh, to work on uh, this kind of artwork. It's a huge space. I occupy as much as possible the space uh, in the museum. Actually, if you look some uh, major Chinese artists like uh, Huang Yongping, Xu Bin, uh, Gu Wenda, and, and Cai Guoqiang, actually, back to 10 years or 20 years ago, the artists you know, made this similar kind of uh, <laughs> big space. And I actually, uh, I, when I organized the four artists exhibition in the state, uh, which include Huang Yongping, Xu Bin, uh, uh, Huang Yuping, Xu Bing, Gu Wenda, and uh, Wu Shan Zhuan. And there's a critic from, uh, American critic, who said that, uh, well, that space is so huge, and this is a socialist space. Uh, actually, uh, that, you know, um, so in some way, it seems to me, what I really has done is to use, perhaps, the socialist or communist way to, against uh, the socialist, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Okay, I just stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Hanru? Oh, um, thank you. Guten uh, Abend. That's the only thing I know. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think Ming Lu's uh, comment is extremely interesting. Uh, to say this, there is a kind of socialist space in that. Um, I would like to actually um, look at the situation of Ai Weiwei's arrest in a bigger pic picture, which is number one, we are in a time when a lot of spectacular events are happening across the, the world, especially for the last few months, that, you know, from the Japanese earthquake to the Arabic revolution to uh, yesterday, two days ago, there's a crash of Chinese high-speed train, and so on and so forth. And this is one of these um, spectacular, uh, spectacular um, um, events that has been uh, very immediately reported, dis distributed, and consumed by the media and by the general public. And so now we are sitting here also uh, in, a, in a space which was another kind of social, socialist space, was designed for uh, celebrating um, a somehow uh, extremely difficult but um, somehow utopian kind of um, uh, spatialization of the sublime power. And this actually, um, of course, um, has not disappeared in history. I guess um, we are sitting here talking about these questions of those spectacular events uh, in the sense that uh, we are actually uh, trying to somehow re-examine the, the actual substance of this, uh, this tension between the sublime and the reality. Um, I would say, you know, this tension today is translated in the context of globalization when the, the old socialist mobilizational kind of spatial policy or, or uh, structure has not disappeared, but being somehow transformed into another kind of uh, uh, sublime space, which is the so-called uh, neoliberal capitalist space. And I, I guess in this context, contemporary art has been somehow shifted from a, an originally a resistance force against the, the sublime to embracing a new form of sublime, being packaged in a new fashion, a new mode, which is perhaps in the name of art, in the name of design, in the name of, uh, of um, dem democratization of the sublime that uh, being turned into a very 
easily um, consumable kind of uh, product of the, of the spectacle. So I think uh, the discussion uh, of the fact of how we confront with this quite controversy kind of uh, uh, event of Ai Weiwei's arrest and release, let's say, uh, at the, uh, this, I would, I would see that in a, in a kind of uh, uh, more complex background. And i rather see that um, as a kind of fixed spectacle, I would actually would like to bring it back to a kind of historical flux, uh, historical kind of um, process. So what, what is problematic here, and I also like uh, Ming Lu signed the petition. I was maybe among one of the first who actually sent out, uh, received the email sent by the Guggenheim Museum and, and sent to other friends to ask them to sign. And the fact that I wanted to sign this petition, it's simply, I guess there's a, a problem with the justice of procedure. But it doesn't mean uh, we are signing for defending a truth or an absolute truth, just like the subline of this utopia space, or simply we are uh, resisting to something that is uh, much more complicated than uh, resistance can uh, actually uh, put forward. So uh, very easily in the tradition of um, the confrontational history between the so-called West and the non-West, or the capitalist camp and the communist camp, there was um, there's a bridge, a, a bargaining chip, which is called the dissidence. And this dissidence, dissidence in this context has not disappeared, but has been transformed to something else. And from time to time, this mechanism comes back with a new package. So whenever we need to negotiate for a new bargain, we would put forward, sometimes more timidly, sometimes more uh, openly, this tiny thing called the dissidence. And this dissidence is very often, in, in terms of its aesthetics, it's very often being formatted in the form of propaganda. And this propaganda uh, goes very well with a space like this. So I guess one should somehow be careful talking about this uh, mechanism. I guess we are trapped somehow in this mechanism. Uh, and th I, I guess this is also what brings me, uh, I read, uh, lately uh, did um, a kind of uh, paper as my conversation with hans Ulrich Obrist in a regular based kind of column writing in the magazine to talk about not only Ai Weiwei, but the general context in which we are actually witnessing uh, today uh, in this dramatic moment. Uh, at the end, I actually suggest us to really to learn from a German who actually has learned from Chinese, which is um, Bertolt Brecht, his idea of the effect of this distantization. One has, I think it's really the moment that we should take a distance, look at this complexity, rather than embracing a one single dimension kind of space of the sublime based on the image of the propaganda. Either it's pro or against certain kind of things. Uh, this is uh, a very quick statement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Han Ru. I think what we have now, uh, uh, a kind of cleaving of the space of discussion uh, from those who are uh, deeply embedded in the art world, embedded in the con its conditions of production and most of transmission, and also um, uh, the, the modes of translation of what the arts, artist does. So now we're going to shift a little bit to um, uh, 
two other positions that perhaps can give us a sense of how this particular question that we are grappling with um, has seeped through other arenas so that we are not really only trapped in this space of the sublime. Um, so I'll give it over to Xi Ming uh, to make his uh, uh, comment. Good night. Good evening. Um, I have to uh, correct the one data about my person. I'm not from <coughs> Deutsche Welle TV. I've become freelance, totally freelance, of good Deutsch, Vogelfreier journalist. <laughs> Um, beside this fact, okay, as a totally free journalist, I have only one task, ask questions. And ask questions means I'm confused. I'm much more confused about every word spoken out, not only here, but generally speaking. I'm confused, firstly, all of us know that China is becoming stronger economically, politically. The Chinese government is starting one offensive after another one to build up so-called soft power. So and so hundred millions are invested, as mentioned, in only one museum. So and so hundred million dollars are uh, spent to give you in a show 2008. But the other was, on the other hand, why is this government getting more and more nervous? What is the fear of this government? Controlling a country becoming day after day stronger. What is the real point that is the first thing which has confused me. It's confusing me more and more. And I think you will show, share my experience. The second one is maybe Ai Weiwei or other artists have become very famous outside of China. But two facts. The one is the blog of Ai Weiwei has registered 10 million clicks with very short times. Not because of his artwork, maybe because of his interpretation of his art conceptions, maybe because of the political statements he done. And what is the motivations of so many Chinese to click his blog? If we believe that the majority of the artists are disconnected to the society, they only are interested in money, making money. And if we just assume that the majority of the urban citizens in China are interested to earn money, spending money, shopping, consuming, what is the real motivation for the same consumers to come again and again to the blog of Dai IVV and other peoples. Another one is Han Han. Another one, I could tell you quite a long list of the people who are stating we are not agreeing with this government, we're not agreeing with the policy. There, is, there has been, I have to say, there has been a, Social irony since 20 years is quite the same what, what issues happen. There is, within a very short time, a very effective irony within the Chinese internet, within the Chinese talkings. And maybe you know this example of uh, uh, Cao Nima, this very special horse which is only uh, um, polyphony for fucking your mother. You know, this, this social irony, even in not very beautiful form, what is the real motivation of an urban society 
from which we just believe that the majority of this society is only interested in consuming. What is this society, society looking for consumption? In terms also of the modern art. This is the second point which can confuse me. And the third, if we just believe that there are so-called dissidents among the artists, if we consume, uh, assume that all the dissidents share one point, they are demanding democracy. Just let's like, like have a look. Two of the professors of the Central Party School wrote articles demanding the same democracy. Are they dissidents? One of the high-ranked general of the People's Liberation Army has given an interview demanding the same democracy. Is he a dissident? How can we measure whether a person, because whatever, becomes dissident? And even the leftists, the Marxist leftists, were blocked by the authorities. We have heard that during the time uh, of so-called Jasmine Revolution in the North uh, Africa, the authority is getting so frightened that they censor one very famous song, so-called Jasmine. And even the soundtrack given by the president, Hu Jintao, he has a song, song this uh, song, and there is a very famous uh, soundtrack. And even his soundtrack was censored away for several weeks. And my question is, can we tell, even within China, who is because what dissident? That is the third point which confused me quite a lot. And I think, I believe, we are going to discuss about all these confusions this evening. I thank you very much. Thank you. OK, um, I think, um, Ximing, thank you. And uh, I certainly believe there is a, a clear line. And these questions, uh, we hope we can take up. And now I turn the mic over to Flora. Uh, to give us a uh, statement. Yes, thank you. I will give a very simple, very brief statement about the law and how Highway Way is posited in relationship both to the law and to political power. We know that uh, he was detained, so to speak, on April the 3rd at the Beijing International Airport to be released only on June the 22nd. And since that very day, a theme in the discourse has been that uh, Ai Weiwei has been freed. I would like to point out how he is by no means a free man. What is interesting about the case of Ai Weiwei is that the law procedural law in this case, is being used to hold Ai Weiwei for ransom. As all of you know, he has been, well, allegations against him are that he has evaded tax. And now the authorities have levied uh, a fine of $1.8 million on him. And the point is that since he was placed on bail pending further investigations. Ai Weiwei will not be free to leave Beijing. He is not free to leave his place of residence. He is not free to talk to journalists. He needs to report to the police whenever the police asks him to report. His blogs have been uh, deleted and he cannot uh, use Twitter. In case he will be unable to pay this huge fine, he will definitely face <laughs> criminal charges that could cost him a conviction of 
up to seven years. You can sense how uh, complicated a situation is. At the same time, a situation could suddenly turn very simple. If he only agreed to give up his critical stance, if he only agreed to stop saying what he thinks, whether, regardless of whether we agree or not with these views, if only he shut it up, the case against him then could be quietly dropped. The measure of bail pending further investigation would be lifted and he would be a free man again. We do not know whether Ai Weiwei will continue keeping, keeping his critical stance or whether he will uh, submit, accept the terms of an agreement with the state and keep silent. We don't know what might happen in the future, but uh, I've made a few hypotheses, a few scenarios of what might occur from here to June the 22nd, 2012, the date when bail should be lifted. From here until, uh, from today until next year, it could be possible that the charges against I would be dropped. The, ca the case against him could be shelved. But a different scenario could, uh, could take place as well. Ai Weiwei could remain on bail pending further investigation until when he has paid the sum of $1.8 million in its entirety, not uh, a penny less. Authorities, the police, seem to be buying time. Uh, a key point is that Ai Weiwei was never formally arrested, and this allows to this allows to, for investigations to continue for a longer time than it would normally be the case. This is to say that it might not necessarily be released next year, in June. It depends. But even after his future release, different things could, uh, could happen. The police might uh, refuse to give him back his passport, alleging that he poses a threat to national security, or he somehow poses a threat to the interests of China. An even worse scenario would be that to retaliate against Ai Weiwei, someone chooses to file a, a civil lawsuit against him, and then he would be prohibited from leaving China for the entire duration of the civil lawsuit. So as you can see, there are many ways in which the law can be used to keep Ai Weiwei in China and to try and uh, keep him silent, so to speak. Okay. I'm sure we, uh, uh, just one, uh, one final <laughs> sentence. Oh, yeah. Uh, the problem I'm concerned, really concerned with, is that this man does not pose any threat to power. His criticism of Chinese politics and his criticism of the party is exactly the same kind of criticism you can find on the internet on Weibo. The point is that uh, if he has posed any challenge to power, then this challenge to power has been a symbolic one. And power has reacted in a symbolic way by using the law instrumentally. So in a way, uh, Ai Weiwei has become a symbol for what truly happens when power sets its, its will in motions. And what truly happens that legal rights at this point offer no protection. Legal rights offer no protection to Ai Weiwei at the moment. But the, mo but the most important thing is that rights will offer no protection to anybody who might embark upon the, very, the same course <coughs> of our way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think, um, I believe, you know, despite the short statements, that we find ourselves um, in 
uh, murkier uh, terrain than when we started. When we started, it seemed as if there was a, a kind of clarity between Ai Weiwei's predicament, um, which really relates to um, the way that many of us who um, are admirers both of his work, his personality, um, his generosity, the expansiveness of his social imagination on the one hand, and some of these other points which really, uh, as Hanru was calling for, a kind of healthy skepticism in the certainty of our position to defend um, questions that are still in many ways unfolding. And I think that from the point of view of this relationship between Ai Weiwei's position vis-a-vis -vis Chinese law and power, and on the other hand, the power of public opinion that was galvanized by the art world, which in many ways we can say was not unheard by the Chinese state. Oh, sorry. Can... Sorry, okay, thank you. <laughs> now I have to collect my thoughts. But you know, this, 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 um, this cleave between these two positions is something that I think we really need to take, take up. I think that she means confusion um, is um, really quite productive um, metaphor for us to use to perhaps unravel this. And, and, I, and I wonder, Shiming, um, in your confusion, um, what are the, you know, the pieces that really are helping you build a coherent picture of what is emerging in relation to this case? Or are you still, are you still eternally in a state of confusion? Or what, is, what do you sense? Um, because you, you made a very important point that while China is getting more powerful at the same time, it's getting more nervous. And where do you think this stems from and how does this relate to Ai Weiwei? I think one of the, my uh, suggestions is um, a country or a government who is going to become stronger has to looking for a very convincing tale, a story that convinces all of us. And the tale should be very moving, very com complete. It could not be the story that we have made so much money. Before China, there are so many countries who have so made so much money. And this tale must include all the members of the society to give the members of the society positions. And this tale must connect the past, the time being, and the future. But nobody, even nobody within the government, knows how the future is going to look like. And I think, uh, as an artist, maybe somebody like Ai Weiwei is also looking for a tale, for a very, very complicated tale, contradictionary tale. And this is the one position that gives some ideas about the society in China, which are, the government refused to accept. This, this society is getting so complicated that every tale to be told about this society should accordingly become complicated. And the government tried to explain the re reality, even some worse reality, in accordance with a very simple pattern. For example, 
the West media, are always talking negatives about China. This is very simple. But it is not the tale even China's young generation wants to hear, because the Chinese society demands another tale. But the government is refusing to give them the aspect of the tale. What is it the young generation doing within the internet? They just, um, they just created their own tales. They just tell a story about uh, a beer and a habit. You know, they say the United Nations have uh, uh, given a demand on all of the police uh, units all over the world to find a certain habit within a certain forest. The American FBI was the first unit. And the FBI using all the modern tools without any success. The second one is Hong Kong police, using all the modern tools of uh, uh, shouting <coughs> 20 hours without any interruption, without any success. In the end, four Chinese policemen entered the forest. Within a few minutes, they came out, followed by a beer, and the beer said, Please don't beat me. I'm the rabbit you are looking for. <coughs> and this story was dropped seven million times within seven discussion forums in the internet. And I think this is a very convincing example that people are looking for a tale, for a creative, convincing tale. And the society is becoming so complicated that never a government would be able to give this tale. The government is forced to create these sales together with the society. Not only with this artist, but also with the other members of the society. I believe that one of the main reasons why Chinese government is becoming frightened even though that Chinese economy is becoming longer, uh, stronger, is this government has failed to find the ways, join the people, create this national tale. This is one of my guesses. Thank you. Well, um, I, I, I can see that resonates. Um, but the, the, maybe perhaps before we jump immediately to the audience, I, I would like to really steer us back to Ai Weiwei, the artist, to his work. And so perhaps Ulrich, um, I, let me ask you, I think that a claim has been made here by both Han Ru and Gao Ming Lu in terms of Ai Weiwei's work and his monumentality, um, sort of representing some kind of anachronism, if you will, um, and it's a kind of socialist anachronism. And I wonder if you share that notion that this monumentality really reflects that anachronism in terms of, um, Andrew gives it the name of the sublime and so on, um, in relation to what took place here in House of Kunst during the exhibition of Ai Weiwei. I mean, you cannot deny there is a, that there is a strong uh, impact of monumentalism in his work and uh, also the sublime. I mean, if you see all these uh, Lauter, Lauter, Lauter um, <laughs> or the, especially the, the, the installation he did for us or which he did for the Turbine Hall, of course, there is a certain way of monumentalism, but I I feel, uh, and I know that this is also raises a controversy to, uh, to ask how political this is, this attitude, this approach. I mean, of course, he was influenced uh, very much by, uh, by Duchamp, by Dada, uh, and the conceptualism. And, uh, but on the other hand, I, I mean, with the, with the 
with a backpack installation, this was, this was very obvious that there is a certain political impact. And um, on the other hand, mm, when you see the sunflower seeds uh, in the turbine hall, which we had only this little hill of one million pieces, uh, where in the turbine hall there were 100 million or even more, I don't know, never counted them. Um, I ask myself whether this is a, uh, yeah, if this is a political work, we spoke about uh, how it was done, how it is traded now, that he's making money out of it. Uh, but I think that the whole production process in a certain way also is a kind of comment on the, on the economical situation, probably. Though I must admit I don't know too much about it. And uh, therefore I think, yes, there is a certain monumentalism in his work, but that it's in a kind of uh, a very sensitive way is being put down to earth again by making these relations to the production process and, as I understand, also to the history of China. Yeah. Um, w w when, when, when I think of Ai Weiwei's work mm -hmm. in relation to his production values and the mechanisms. Immediately what comes, up to, comes to mind is the notion of labor and the laboring body. And if you take this into the question of China being the factory of the world, it kind of unfolds many different things. So the question is, on the one hand, if we can ask a question about Ai Weiwei, why can't we ask the question of this, the relationship between the work and the laboring body? Do we choose one particular type of resonance over the other? I mean, I think it's just a question to really uh, observe. And uh, yeah. Uh, I think um, the third point that comes to it is, of course, the art market. Mm. I mean, if you are talking about the labor and, that, and, and, and the relation to labor, that, um, that Ai Weiwei is demonstrating in many of his works, it becomes only a problem if you see it in relation to the Western art market. And that makes it kind of dicey, you know, if he, if he has these millions of little pieces being handmade and produced on the one hand, and then now they are selling for, I don't know, maybe a tenth or a hundred times as much as one single piece has, uh, um, has cost him. So that makes it, I think, a real problem. And that brings us to the question if he is in a certain way exploiting labor or is he kind of uh, showing us or demonstrating us how labor is exploited. Okay, um, I think maybe this is a good time to open up the floor. Um, the uh, speakers have given their piece and I think it would be great to hear more from them uh, based on your own reflections and your own questions or comments. And so I invite you all um, not to be shy and to, um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and may I please say uh, to make your comments and your questions brief so we can really give as many people as possible the chance to speak. Okay, over there. Is this on? Hello? Yeah. Is it on? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Um, yeah, I have, I have uh, my name is Tamiko Thiel. I have several questions. And one is uh, on the, the last discussion. If he had continued just to make sunflower seeds, would they have arrested him? Or is it really about the fact that he was investigating the earthquake and the deaths of the children and the tofu schools and the failure of the system? Uh, next, uh, next question uh, on, the, on the story, on China searching for a narrative. Usually when countries do this, the narrative is nationalism, is a story about us against them, and it ends up in war. 
Do, you think, do any of you think that's the story that China is looking for? Another question, um, can you talk about the um, big exhibit that the German government sponsored called Enlightenment, Aufklärung, mm. that uh, happened right at the time that Ai Weiwei was being arrested? Thank you. Okay. Um, who wants to take up the first question? Hanru? Or well, Lindo? I don't think anyone here is in the position to find an so answer to that because Honestly, there's, because there's no open explanation of the, uh, why he was, was arrested, I guess uh, we can only guess. Um, there are many, 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 many guesses. Um, but at the end of the day, I think there's one possibility. It's actually, we are in a time that, um, as Xu Ming just um, pointed out, uh, we are in a time that there's a general lack of le politique so everyone is involved with the game of la politique, meaning power games. So la politique meaning there's a political vision for society with a truly constructed vision and project and, and the mechanism to produce the conditions to realize that. When we, are in the lack of this, we would easily fall into the, the kind of endless, infinite power game that every member in the society would be kind of uh, trapped into. I guess the case of Ai Weiwei's arrestation has to do, on the one hand, to do with what he was doing, which is basically uh, a product of a larger system, which is, as I try to explain, which is the art, contemporary art activity is becoming a mainstream entertainment industry with a little hint of political art. That means the continuation of this ideological struggle or fight, confrontation between different camps, uh, taking a new form. On the other hand, I guess it has to do with the general climate of how some governmental organs are feeling certain kind of threats because of the general climate, for example, the Arabic revolution, the internal struggle within China, uh, the, the division of rich and poor, and so on. The irony is actually a lot of artists today, successful artists in China, belongs to the upper part of the society as those who take advantage of the social division. And for some reasons, they, come, they would use that uh, to claim a certain kind of political uh, position in the, the game of la politique. So I guess, you know, I will understand this from this perspective. And then the next one, I guess, there are a lot of rumors about, well, because, you know, this person is connected to this person, this person has this person as a kind of backdrop, supporting power, and, he, and other guys, they are, they are big balls are losing power, so they need to have some victims. They need to have some, you know, kind of, again, a bargaining chip. So I guess, you know, there are many, many possibilities to explain this. But I guess, you know, essentially what is important, again, is we in, exactly in this chaotic context, one has to ask, even, you know, the, the question that Fiora was man mentioning about the legal uh, the, the legal system. In fact, this is a general universal situation of how all the laws being applied in different societies. I mean, we are still seeing Berlusconi sitting in the palace of the prime minister, right? Which is highly unimaginable. But we are seeing that every day. This is, uh, yeah? yeah, I wanted to point out maybe that. So, so that's... This yeah. is something that has got to do with the law yeah. itself. It's yeah. a kind of property yeah. of the law so of power. Want, so it's cross yeah. systemic. You, you. Yeah. Again, I, I, I want to come back to you know the question of what is an artist today? What he needs to do? There are many possibilities to be an artist, but essentially, what is the real uh, ethic status of an artist? That's the question. It's a highly open question, but somehow we 
we might resort to some very basic Henry, can, no I, can I ask you to speculate a, a bit about why I were where? Why not artist X? Why him? There must have been a reason. Well, uh, I, I, I guess. I, I, there must have been a reason why I were where was arrested. <laughs> uh, can you speculate on, 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 well, on, on that? I, actually, I have to say there are a few other artists being arrested for different reasons. As Ming Lu just pointed out, there was an, right before that, there, were, there was an artist who tried to do a very provocative performance, having sex in front of the public. And after three hours, he was taken to the police station and fined. Yeah, but, right? that's, but that's so, only very different. Okay, all right, so they're different. <laughs> but does, I think the case of Ai Weiwei is because he is, for some reasons, especially when uh, Okui just mentioned for the last three or five years, suddenly became a kind of symbol a kind of icon um, uh, in this process of how, actually for me is essentially who owns the concept of contemporary art, concept, uh, the concept of Chinese contemporary art, who owns that? The art market, the government, the individual critics, the artists, the collectors, the museums, which museum, so on and so forth. So, I guess, in a way, the, he somehow represents a, a kind of um, uh, object in which you can project your, your speculated concept of that. So this is why um, when certain things happen, um, we need to somehow attack the, con the icon. I think that's basically uh, the reason. But the okay, okay. Uh, can, 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 uh, yeah, can we wait, um, Henry, uh, so, if we uh, can give um, other people the chance to ask yes, questions sorry. or maybe comments? Maybe uh, I want to bring it back to Ming Lu um, to maybe to take up if you know after the, the, the question has been asked. Uh, okay, there, there are still uh, two questions asked. Okay. Two answers, okay, yeah. okay. So, so, so mean, sorry, yes. a very, very uh, short attempt. And I think enlightenment, it is a very, very key word, key uh, uh, understanding. And I think um, the main contradiction is in China that the Communist Party itself has been the strongest political movement who has tried to realize somehow um, enlightenment in the Chinese history. And all the values, political values, we are now hearing, including democracy, human rights. This party itself has tried to declare all of these values for its political movement not only in the past, in the war against Kuomintang, but even today. One of the professors of the Central Government Carter School has written an article, 2007. The title is, The Democracy is a Beautiful Issue. The Great Issue. The Communist Party itself has been trying to realize some, some enlightenment, but only in accordance to its self-interest. It is the same party who refuses to practice what he is enlightening people, but without any consequence against itself. And I think to give some idea, I cannot answer your, uh, your, your, your question about the narrative, but I think it is one of the contradictionary also for the same party to find a national narrative. Because the same party has declared, A, has been doing all the times B and C, 
Another example, Confuci Confucius. You know, there are so many Confucius institutes all over the world. Uh, only in, in Germany, there are 10, 12 Confucius institutes. But up to now, I haven't registered any serious discussion about the figure Confucius, Confucius about Confu Confucianism. And the people in Beijing registered on one morning that a very high statue of Confucius appears alongside the Chang'an, the main street. And the other, and the, and the other morning, they, they see that the statue disappeared. <laughs> the party has decided to build up this statue and to let it disappear again without any expl explanation. Found it so many Confu Con Confucius Institutes as symbol of the central Chinese tradition, central Chinese value without in any explanation why the same party has criticized, has condemned the same Confu Confucius all of the decades. And I think all of the contradictionaries, the same Communist Party has to explain is making finding this so complicated national narrative so difficult. Even finding a national nationalistic narrative. The, the Marxist This is, it may be it is not the, the art uh, made by Ai Weiwei, but the Ai Weiwei is looking for a narrative. Even his uh, expression with the children damaged by uh, earthquake and by corruption of the government is one part of the narrative. Yeah. And I think it, also this is same, same flower seeds. I, as Chinese, with the memory of the Cultural Revolution. At that time, all the children, like me, we loved comparing ourselves with sunflower, following the sun. The sun is the Chairman Mao. And the seed is the symbol of the generation, new generation. And I, as I saw his expression, a, a expression I thought, or oh, this is a part of the past, we have experienced directly so many very tiny seeds without life because made of uh, ceramic. It is seeds without any chance to become life. This is my very individual interpretation. And I think if so many Chinese join this kind of interpretation or other interpretations, the art has contributed one of the very complicated part to finding the national narrative. Thank you. This is very compelling. Very, very compelling. Uh, uh, please, let's, let's give uh, other you know, people a chance to address the question. Min Lu. Uh, yeah, very uh, interesting comment. I think it's a complicated, uh, complicated situation right now in China. Uh, I just actually a couple of days ago I read article, uh, commentary article published actually by, you know, Huan Qiu Ri Bao. It's an official um, actually newspaper, uh, which says nobody can drive the media, public media, oriented to a single, uh, single orientation, and we all, including government are the ships moving on the ocean. So that means that nobody is able to control one direction. And we are always driven by something that is very difficult to be defined. So that is, the government even himself agree that this is actually experimental society. That's something, I also remember just the, when I, 
uh, answer the question uh, in uh, Yale University uh, last month when I have a dialogue with uh, somebody else. And the question is, ask me about Xu Bin and Ai Weiwei. It's two different cases. So, because Xu Bin just got the interview, and, he, and somebody asked him uh, <coughs> to be a vice president in Central Academy of Fine Arts. So what do you feel about Ai Weiwei's case? Actually, Xu Bin is very interesting. Xu Bin didn't answer the question very straightforward. But rather, he answered that, I want to collaborate with uh, the government. So this seems different kind of a political stance, different kind of political situation, a di different kind of uh, a view on the current Chinese society. But I think my view is that the both, I think, is a valuable significance in China. Uh, perhaps also there's a different way uh, because you look at the government. The government is not just the uh, uh, monopoly. Uh, it's just, there's a, within the government, there's somebody with open mind and someone want to push uh, the Chinese society uh, to have social reform. And they're always struggling. And this time also, to me, it's very interesting. Ai Weiwei is rest in airport. Usually in the past, it's not this kind of case. Everybody know that if government hit you, you're a troublemaker, we just send you out, okay? Wei Jingsheng, Fang Li Jun, Fang Li Zhi, and many uh, distant, they have been sent out to uh, America especially. But this time, why they hold Ai Weiwei? inside China, rather than let him go, if you're a troublemaker. So I think that's, you know, also, uh, is to me show that one reason is the government want to give him a punishment. And because perhaps his troublemaker, even though it's not for central government, but perhaps for Sichuan government, because the earthquake, okay, or, uh, the Chinese government now have confidence that they don't worry about any response from outside China. I just want to hold you and want to put you in jail. And so what? You know? So this is you know, a different kind of reason perhaps for uh, government to do that. Finally, I think answers the question to Aukui. Why? Um, and, you know, uh, about Ai Wei's artwork. Um, I think Ai Wei Wei um, continued the Chinese avant-garde strategy in the way he tried to find um, certain kind of a content, then turn this, uh, uh, find something uh, very unique. Okay. So for example, this time, uh, Ai Weiwei, if you look at Ai Weiwei's uh, history in the last 10 years, he played more role in social activity rather than in art uh, activity. He turned certain kind of social activity into art as content, uh, like uh, uh, his, uh, his political, uh, political activities and to push to make these avant-garde works more um, attract for or shock uh, the public. But this time, actually, the influence, uh, the impact, actually is not on artwork very much, but rather on uh, the public. Uh, then the public response uh, come back to the art world and also from outside uh, China, the international uh, profile of Ai Weiwei also give art, uh, Chinese contemporary art world more um, influence. So I think this um, 
Al Kui mentioned about this radical radicality uh, in Chinese contemporary art uh, that you know uh, already is taking place for three decades. Uh, and uh, the question is, for example, also some uh, artists, one artist called Zhu Yi Hu uh, ate a uh, baby, the real body, uh, the dead baby, uh, he found from hospital. He cooked it uh, at home, then eat uh, the baby. So that is kind of very extreme, this kind of uh, uh, avant-garde artwork. Uh, but how can we define, how can, how can we, this question is that if you want to represent the truth of this society, like for example, every way use um, certain work to represent the uh, labor, the capitalism in China, how this kind of violence process the course uh, of uh, meeting China, this the industry. But can you make this artwork in the same way as how violent that produced in a society like Zhu Yu, if he, he want to use his artwork to represent, you know, this creativity of art, uh, of the society, because something related to what is the foundation of art creation, because representation. Art is metaphor. How far you can go to uh, so that that is that is a question. But uh, but this also related to the boundary between uh, art and politics. Uh, so I just okay. I, I'm very sure that there are many comments that one can dedicate to this one question. So um, perhaps there are other comments or questions that we can take. Uh, back there. I have two types of questions. One is a little bit simpler and the other is perhaps a little bit more complicated. The first question I would direct to Guaming Lu. I, would, um, I was wondering if you can make assumptions why A Weiwei's art is not so, why the majority of the Chinese people are perhaps not so much interested in A Weiwei's work. And also, um, would they have protested as stark and as vehement um, like the Western society did if they would be more familiar with his work? This is the easier question. And the more perhaps vague, but for me interesting question is, what does um, Wei Weiwei's politicization of art tells us, the Western society, about our desires, what of art should affect? Uh, I didn't follow too much, but uh, uh, so you asked me uh, why I, uh, okay, I try to, uh, tr not very clear, but I try to an answer your question. Do you want him to rephrase it? Yeah. Um, Can you yeah. just make a very, very lo little bit loudly, yeah. I, I rephrase it and make it perhaps more simple. So the question is, would, would, would have the Chinese people demonstrated a more vehement and stark or radical if they would have known the work of, uh, the artwork of uh, Ai Weiwei? Yeah. And it's, it's somehow also interesting to understand why they don't know the work of Ai Weiwei. Yeah, uh, when I will be returned to China in 1993, um, as you just mentioned before, uh, who in the 1980s, a lot of Chinese artists already learned, you know, Dada, conceptual, pop, and, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, Western contemporary art movement. So it's not a very surprise, and, it, you know, when I will be try to in light, you know, the Chinese artists. And actually, uh, in my recent book, I just published by MIT, I mentioned about the apartment art. In early 1990s, uh, there are a lot of artists to stay home in private space because, you know, 1989, uh, after 1989, there's, 
you know, garment, make very street kind of uh, controls part of the, the, the space. And artists uh, make work at home. But at that time, everybody play. He tried to, he, he is one of the, uh, several important uh, couples uh, who uh, moved back to China. And everybody and his wife, uh, Lu Qing and Xu Bin and Cai Jin and Zhu Jinshi and um, uh, his wife. There are several uh, artists who trained in the West, uh, returned to China. So I, and, and, and those were long trap the movement called, so I gave a name called Apartment Art. Um, but still, um, he was not very uh, influential. Uh, one of his exhibitions he organized in Shanghai along uh, 1999, along uh, Shanghai Biennial Exhibition, is called? Huh? 2000. Uh, 2000, okay. Fuck out. Fuck Actually, off. Uh, it's called fuck off. Uh, fuck yeah, off. Sure. Fuck <laughs> off. I'm sorry. Uh, fuck <laughs> out. It was very interesting when he translated this into Chinese. It's called resistance collaboration. <laughs> it's nothing to do with uh, with uh, fuck out. And um, that's the real politics. Yeah. Um, and this this exhibition actually uh, among the exhibition is most influential before. Uh, before maybe 2007. Um, and, uh, but uh, I always get famous is because he involved in investigation of uh, Sichuan's earthquake and other uh, political activities. I think that is very important. It seems to me if I Weiwei go further and directly to be involved in this kind of social, political activity, rather than to use our work to address certain kind of social problem, is more powerful. The first way is more powerful. So this, because also it's kind of unique, very unique kind of phenomenon. Right now in China, Artists, you know, thinking a different way from uh, Ai Weiwei. But no matter Ai Weiwei truly want to be a politician or want to be an artist, but it seems to me Ai Weiwei still want to be an artist. And by you, you know, by acting in, 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 in politics. Uh, so this makes, you know, his work um, somehow, you know, different. I think he could be a very good cultural minister at the provincial level. <laughs> okay, um, we, we, we have just only a few minutes left before we wrap up, and if there are um, more questions, okay, there's one question over here. Um, I, hello, yeah, I'm, I'm from a uh, southern province of China called Australia. Uh, we supply most of the minerals uh, to build the nation. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if maybe this situation, because it seems to me there's a divide, there's the Chinese world which, in which a, the question of Asia hasn't been brought up. And then there's the Western world. But I, I wonder to, to what extent this predicament of Ai Weiwei actually activates the political dynamic of Western art of Western art institutions. Um, and, and I think this is brought up by the idea that the Guggenheim Museum might send around a petition for art historians, etc., to sign. Any thoughts to that? Can I answer this? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> please. This is a very funny game. Um, I guess Oakley has a term called uh, liberal uh, Reflex. I think this reflex has a very long history related to how the idea of human rights was invented and being distributed as the only truth of human values around the world. Um, so this sudden kind of awakening of the Western institutions' um, love for dissidents um, somehow actually signifies one thing very, very interesting is for the last 20 years, 
we tend to think there's anyway one model of society that is uh, effective or true or reliable, whatever, globally, that is a combination of this human rights system or so-called democracy based on this concept of human rights, which is very clearly defined, actually, over uh, three very contradictory notions, which is liberty, fraternity, equality, right? And these three things, when you put together, they don't work. You have to always negotiate, right? And that's, and another thing is actually, at the end of the day, it's this illusion of, e of equality that actually, uh, of freedom, of liberty that wins. That is the power of the capital. So basically, we are living in a time that uh, we, we embrace, even in the most uh, independent domain, which is called contemporary art, they embrace this, taken it for really granted. But now we are facing one thing. We try to extend this ideal utopian world to the other. Either in a, within the, the West or globally. In this situation, we are actually seeing one very interesting problem. That is, we are increasingly losing some two very important essential aspects of the so-called human rights to favor one. Um, and the outcome is actually the kind of division of the society again. And in this moment, there's a necessity to be awakened, to rethink in which society we are in. And the case of Ai Weiwei actually reminds us suddenly that um, there's still some troubles out there. And so we need to address that so we don't feel we are guilty. I think there is a, a very deep kind of, almost like a, the religious sin kind of um, mechanism out there, uh, which is this reflex. So I would actually understand that from this perspective. Maybe I could uh, uh, add as an, in another aspect. We used to talk about who is dissident and what characteristics should somebody show to become a dissident. I found um, a very interesting video clip within the Chinese YouTube, Tudo, showing an old man, uniformed, in the uniform of the People's Re uh, Liberation Army has microphone, he turned around, he rapped, just like a young boy. <laughs> he rapped in this way. He said, great chairman, great chairman Mao made us strong, but the evil Deng Xiaoping made us poor. We are all appraising uh, um, appreciate, appreciate human rights we wish back our chairman Mao. Now, I think this video clip could become at, um, become a very good performance because focusing all of the aspects of the contradictionary of our worthlessness we don't have any convincing wording to describe our problems without any punishment, to explain our past. We are looking for figures who could tell us some of the aspects. And I think back to your uh, uh, question. I think uh, the majority of the even Western in intellectuals have paid quite a lot of attention to the so-called political questions of human rights. But they failed to pay the same attention to the social aspects of the human rights of a very broad mass. 
They failed to pay attention to this worthlessness of the mass in the society. They just say, we tell you this is our human right. Please accept it. And we have all the decades practicing this. It cannot work. And it doesn't work. Because I think we could talk about Ai Weiwei's artwork uh, just we like. One of the aspects is, my colleague is uh, telling this story, it's very strong to find out, to find back the connections to the society, to the mass. It's quite the same, it is art or it is not art. But finding back the connection to the society, to the mass, to their problems, to their narratives. This is a very, very urgent task for all of the Chinese intellectuals, and I mean for all of the critical intellectuals even in the Western. Very well said. I think we've now come to the conclusion of our panel. Um, I think uh, it's very clear that um, there are no resolutions. Um, beyond the fact that Hanru has maintained his critical skepticism. Um, no, I'm Ming skeptical Lu. being critical. OK. <laughs> um, Ming Lu, um, somewhat conciliatory in the sense of really the complexity of the historical turns from which uh, I were aware as an artist and as a social figure has emerged and Flora trying to give us a sense of the legal implications and how the legal apparatus uh, is deployed uh, in relation to subjects like Ai Weiwei between uh, the juridical and the political. And, you know, Xi Ming, um, if I may summarize, really offered us a very, uh, you know, series of questions, uh, not least of which is this notion of the development of or the search you know, for a narrative. The question of the national imagination as a central preoccupation. Who owns uh, the, the capacity to produce this, this state that can make Confucius appear and disappear? Or is it really nested in the people? But, most, but also importantly is this beautiful summation of the sunflower seeds that for me is really revelatory. Because I think on the one hand one can search in Ai Weiwei's work for the sign, for signs of the political, besides the kind of the backpacks of the, of the children in the but I think this is really one work that you can say is really subversive, that its intended audience is not us. It's really, you know, a different audience. And, and I think this is really it kind of sharpens uh, our awareness of the, the scale of Ai Weiwei beyond just simply somebody who is, um, uh, you know, um, a social media uh, maven. And of course, um, Ulrich, um, you know, again, try to sort of to really reconcile some of these aspects of what are the, of the things that. Um, you know, that concerned, you know, the exhibition of Ai Weiwei here is monumentality, you know, the kind of, um, you know, deadpan <laughs> um, way in which, um, you know, this notion of the sublime that Han Ru took up, you know, was replicated here. I, is from, from my own point of view, I think there are many, many different questions, and I think it should not only rest on Ai Weiwei. I think is a question that we ourselves have to ask or was, you know, ask these questions. Um, when was the last time we cared about the predicament of an artist or an intellectual in China before Ai Weiwei? Uh, but nevertheless, it's given us a pointer, a larger frame of reference to think. And I want to thank um, the panelists for agreeing to come here to open up the debates um, and I think, for, for my part, I've learned a lot. Um, things I, I, I never knew that um, Huan Jingtao, who
Hu Jintao censored himself. He took himself off the YouTube, <laughs> off the internet. So that's really very important, the, the, the president or the party censoring the president. But nevertheless, thank you all for coming, um, uh, for giving us your time, and um, um, again, help me um, you know, give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.